Hi, and uh, welcome to The Wandering Wesleyan. This is Chaplain Greg, and uh, I'm so grateful that you're here. And uh, a whole bunch of new subscribers have come on board, and welcome to you all. Um, glad to see you. If you are enjoying the content that I'm putting out, please like the videos on YouTube and subscribe to my channel. Uh, leave a comment. I'd love to hear what you're thinking. Um, we are going to be starting a brand new series. So we finished up the Walking in the Word series, and then we had a little one with our uh, three unexpected evangelists, and, which, were, which was a sermon series. And now we're going to begin uh, a series called Stories of the Rabbi, and it's a study on the Gospel of Mark. And uh, Mark is one of my favorite Gospels. Uh, it's short. It's, it's not long. It's action-packed. It, there's a lot going on. There's a lot of activity and movement. And um, it's also the source for Matthew and Luke. There's, it's a source document that both of them used. So um, getting started here, uh, who is Mark? Well, Mark is first mentioned in Acts, 20, Acts 12, uh, verse 12 which says, as soon as he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, who was called Mark, where many had assembled and were praying. Um, so Mark is mentioned in the book of Acts, and tradition has it that Mary, his mother, owned the upper room where Jesus and the disciples had their last supper, and uh, where Pentecost happened, where the Holy Spirit fell in Acts 2. Uh, we know from Colossians 4.10, he was a cousin to Barnabas, he was called John Mark, and this was a tradition uh, of the time that you would have a Jewish name. If you were a Jewish person, you had a Jewish name. So his name was Jonah or Jonah or John. Uh, that was his Jewish name, but his Greek name would be Mark. Um, Paul mentions him in 2 Timothy 4.11 and Philemon 24. Um, it's important that Paul mentions him in those two passages because he appears to have a, 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 a have had a split with Paul. So um, initially, when 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 Mark accompanied Paul and Barnabas on the first missionary journey, he went only so far, and then he turned back and came back, and that caused a rift not only between Mark and Paul, but it also caused a rift between Mark and Barnabas, his cousin. Um, Barnabas and Mark on the second missionary journey went off to Cyprus and uh, Paul then went on with Silas for the second missionary journey. Um, it appears that he had a deep relationship with Peter and he's mentioned in 1 Peter 5.13 as Peter's son. Um, this is important because the tradition is, is that Mark wrote his gospel as a series of notes and stories that he collected from the Apostle Peter. So when you hear Mark's words, think of Peter telling Mark these things. Um, Mark eventually, after, uh, after uh, he grew in the faith and he became more mature, uh, he grew in the faith and, and traveled to Alexandria, Egypt, and founded churches in Alexandria, Egypt. Now, Alexandria, Egypt was the center of learning for that day. It was the place where you went if you were a scholar of any kind. Um, and the library there was uh, noted throughout the world as being one of, the, one of, if not the grandest library in all of the world. And this is where Mark was going. Um, he founded churches there, and to this day, if you talk to somebody who is an Egyptian Coptic, they believe that Mark is the founder of their church, and that they are the one of the oldest traditions, Christian traditions that still exist today. He was said to be executed on Easter morning by a mob of pagans who tied him to a horse and dragged him to death around the city. So um, even though he had a rough start with Paul on his first missionary journey, he more than made up for it. So let, let's 
talk about the gospel a little bit. So this is a very compact gospel. This is a gospel that moves quickly. Um, like I said, it was probably dictated to Mark by Peter. Um, it could have been written as early as 35 uh, AD, but was probably written somewhere around 50 to 64. The writing reflects, and this is important, it reflects direct observation. So it's not a translation of oral traditions. It is somebody saying, I saw this, this is what happened. Um, so that, that's the nature uh, of the gospel. Um, there is an abrupt beginning. So Mark jumps right into Jesus's ministry. Uh, Matthew throws up a genealogy before he goes into the uh, before he goes into the nativity. Uh, Luke takes a long time, chapter one and chapter two, talking about John's uh, John the Baptist and his. Uh, and how he came to be, and then the nativity scene. So both Matthew and Luke take a long time uh, getting to Jesus's ministry, where Mark just jumps right in. And the ending is abrupt, and when we get to the end, uh, many videos down the line, you'll see that there's a little controversy around that, and I'll talk about that when we get there. 97% um, of Mark is in Matthew. 88% of Mark is in Luke. So what does this mean? This means that he was a source for, for Matthew and Luke when they were writing their gospels. Matthew was also an observer because he was there when things happened, but um, he also uh, had things that he wanted to collect from Mark because this is Peter's point of view. So he was getting his own point of view and Peter's point of view when Matthew was putting his gospel together. Luke, on the other hand, um, as you have, if you if you remember the video that we did on uh, Luke, uh, he was a researcher and he was looking to get into all of the um, uh, all of the witnesses and talk about uh, what had happened and interview people. That was Luke, and so he uses Mark as a resource document in his research on the life of Jesus. Uh, another thing, Mark is a name dropper. So when he mentions a name, uh, it's really, really important to keep an eye on that name because what he's saying is, and it, it, especially when it seems like, why is he, why are we getting this guy's name? I have no idea why we're getting this guy's name. Well, one of the reasons is because Mark is saying to the audience that is reading the gospel, if you don't believe me, go ask this guy. This is the guy that uh, is telling me this. So it's a way, you know, we have bibliographies and we have footnotes in our in our research papers today. This is a way of him doing a footnote saying, yeah, you don't believe me, go to this guy. He, he'll tell you. Um, some reasons for the gospel. Okay, there are three essential reasons why Mark wrote this gospel. The first reason is called catechal, okay? So if you know what a catechism is, a catechism is a book of questions and answers for people that um, are interested in the faith and have questions about the faith and wanna know the doctrine of the faith. The Westminster, Westminster Catechism comes to mind. Um, Heidelberg Catechism. Um, there, are, there are a number of catechisms out there um, that you can use. The Roman Catholic Church has has its catechism. The uh, Global Methodist Church has its own catechism now, which is wonderful. I'm, I'm so glad that they did that. Um, so Mark is catechal, and what he's doing in this gospel is preserving the apostolic tradition. So he's he's bringing what Peter experienced and what Peter teaches about Jesus through the story of Jesus. Second of all, it's pastoral. It's a call to the church to persevere through persecution. And keep that in mind when we read passages in the Gospel of Mark about persecution. Uh, persecution uh, comes up frequently 
in in the Gospel of Mark, and it's and it's pastoral, uh, saying that you know Jesus understands the persecution that the church is going through, that you as an individual believer are going through. Lastly, it's theological, and it is there to correct false and inadequate teachings. Because, I mean, as soon as Jesus was assumed, uh, uh, went into heaven to sit at the right hand of God, uh, and the Holy Spirit fell, well, then bad teaching came up. There's all, the, the enemy is always after the church in uh, distorting bad views. It goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden when uh, the enemy distorted God's word uh, to Eve and lied to God, lied to Eve about what God said. So with that, let's get into Mark. So if you got your Bibles, whether it be analog, not my analog Bible here, or digital, if you got your phone. Uh, so if you go to your Bible to Mark chapter one, verses one through thirteen. Now, this section can be divided into four parts. The prologue is verses 1 through 3. The ministry of John the Baptizer is verses 4 through 8. The baptism of Jesus, verses 9 through 11. And Jesus' temptation is verses 12 through 13. So, let's start with the prologue, verses 1 through 3. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet. See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you. He will prepare your way, a voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make his paths straight. Okay, lots going on in there. So first of all, Jesus is immediately identified as the Christ or the Messiah the Messiah, the Son of God, which means that he is equal to God. Now, this title, Son of God, is immediately identified by people of that day and identified by the early Christians as a title that the emperor of Rome would give to themselves. The Caesar would declare themselves the Son of God, the Son of a God, making themselves a God in the pantheon. So, when Mark writes, this is the beginning of the gospel or the good news or the euangelion, the good news of Yeshua, Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God, making Jesus, the Messiah, equal to God. It's sort of a poke in the eye to the Romans, as well as letting the readers know that this person, Jesus, is God declaring himself to be God. Son of God is a kingship or God title. And the book is identified as good news, euangelion. Gospel, if your translation says gospel, and most translations do, gospel is a word that comes from the Old English. So it's carried over from the King James Version and all the other versions keep that particular uh keep that particular one up. And uh, so gospel in the old English means uh, it's a kind of a greeting. Good spell was originally how they would say it. Good spell. It was a greeting. How are you? How's your day going? Good spell. After verse one, we have some Old Testament passages that are quoted here by Mark. So uh, Exodus 23.30, Malachi 3.1, and Isaiah 43. So what is Mark doing by quoting these, these, two, uh, these three passages and these two verses? He is linking the euangelion, the gospel, and Jesus, and John the Baptist to a fulfillment of the prophecy of Scripture. Okay, he is leaking Jesus to the Jewish scriptures, to the Hebrew scriptures, as a fulfillment of the Hebrew scriptures. Let's go to John the Baptist in verses 4 through 8. Now notice, there's no nativity scene. Mark just breezes right over that. Verses 4 through 8. 
John came baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and they were baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. John wore a camel hair garment with a leather belt around, around his waist and, lo and ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, one who is more, this is important, one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie his strap of his sandals. I baptize you with water. But what does he do? He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. All right. No nativity narrative. John the baptizer, or more accurately, John the one who baptizes. Now there's four elements here to John's teaching. First of all, baptism. Obviously, the word baptismo indicates an immersion or a sinking in. Uh, baptismo in Jesus' day was done through uh, ritual hand washing or mikvahs, which were baths, ritual cleanings. This was not something that was new to the people, but accompanying a call to repentance was something new. And John was calling people to prepare their hearts because the Messiah was coming. The second part of Jesus of John's preaching is repentance. Okay, metanoia literally means a changing of the mind, a going in a new direction. Uh, so if you are uh, going down the road and uh, you are seeing a sign for a city that is in complete opposite direction of the city that you're trying to go to, you need to make a repentance. You need to turn around and go the other way. That's what repentance really means. It means a changing of the mind, go the other way, change your heart. Okay, forgiveness, a thesis, a diminishing of debt. This is, a, this is an economic term. It means a dimish, diminishing of, demet, of debt, pardoning or release. It's a legal term. It's a, it's a financial term. But here, Mark is using it in a way that is um, talking about we all have a debt. Okay? And we need to be forgiven of that debt. That debt is going to be the next part of John the Baptist's uh, message, and that is sin, harmatia, which is failure, missing the bullseye, not following, not following what God has said we should do. So we are baptized, we are immersed, we are cleansed after we have repented, turned around, and gone the other way and receive forgiveness, which is a forgiveness of our debt, a pardon and release of the consequences of that debt because of the sin that we have committed, which is the debt that we've been forgiven of because of our repentance, and that is demonstrated through baptism. The wilderness that is talked about here is an area east and north of the Dead Sea, probably where Israel crossed over into the Promised Land. Uh, the description of John the Baptist probably links him to the Essene community uh, in Qumran on that area of the Dead Sea. Um, maybe he was in a scene, maybe he wasn't, we're not too sure, but it kind of looks that way. Verses 7 and 8, John's message is one of baptism, repentance, forgiveness of sins, but it's ultimately a message pointing to the coming of Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Now, that's where I'm going to leave you for today. We have two other sections to get through, which we will do next week, as well as continue on in the Gospel of Mark to the next section. But until then, if you are enjoying these videos, please like and subscribe and uh, leave a comment. Love to know what you're thinking about this. And uh, we're going to continue next week with the Gospel of Mark and uh, the beginning of this wonderful Gospel. But until then, God bless.